Humans spend one third of their lives asleep, and there's no doubt that the amount of quality, undisturbed sleep we get has a tremendous impact on our health. According to the American Sleep Apnea Association, more than 22 million adults in the United States suffer from obstructive sleep apnea, or OSA. Although sleep apnea can easily be diagnosed and successfully treated, up to 80% of those estimated cases go undiagnosed. And for those whose breathing is interrupting their sleep, the consequences can be deadly. Today, understanding obstructive sleep apnea, the importance of a management plan, and some innovative technology that just may help you take back your nights and your dreams. I'm Erica Vitrini. Access Health starts now. Many of us snore, and oftentimes, the one who snores the loudest is the butt of jokes. Joining us now to further discuss obstructive sleep apnea, or OSA, is professor, author, pulmonary, and sleep specialist at USC in Los Angeles, Dr. Raj Desgupta. Welcome, Dr. Raj, thank you for joining us. Well, Erica, thank you for having me here. This is great to finally talk about disease I'm very passionate about, obstructive sleep apnea. Right, well, let's jump right in then. So what exactly is OSA, and how do we know when a snore is just a snore or something more serious? Well, Erica, the answer is you don't. We make a bunch of different noises at night sometimes, but let me just put everyone at ease. Not everyone that snores has obstructive sleep apnea. And on that note, what is, what is apnea? apnea? What does that word mean? It means no flow. Flow of what? Air. No oxygen in, no carbon dioxide out. And it's gonna be repetitive closures of the upper airways, which we talk the nose, the mouth, the back of the throat called the posterior pharynx, and even areas above the vocal cords. So doctor, what are the symptoms and what should we be aware of? So let's keep it simple. What are the daytime symptoms? Being excessively fatigued, tired, excessive daytime sleepiness. But also patients can say, I'm getting these headaches when I wake up in the morning. They have this sore throat, this dry mouth. But then let's talk about the nighttime. Always think of that choking and gasping sensation. But the most important thing is, I see my bed partner stop breathing. So Erica, there's two cues in sleep quantity and quality. Mm -hmm. So if you're getting a good quantity of sleep, which is gonna be around seven to eight hours in most individuals, I know it's tough to get that, Very. and you're still tired, sleepy, fatigued during the day, it's the quality. And when you have mm -hmm. obstructive sleep apnea, you can't get to those deeper stages of sleep. It's a real disease. So we talk about this snoring and the partner's getting confused and yep. upset, but it's, it's a serious topic. Are there certain people that are more prone to OSA? And are there lifestyle factors that are more, that contribute to OSA? Of course. And you know, I think this comes down to what are the risk factors and how as a clinician do I say, you need to be evaluated for OSA? So this is great. You know, in my office, I actually use a questionnaire. There are many of them out there. And one of the ones I have is called the Stop Bang Questionnaire. You can go to sleepapnea.com and, and it has the same questionnaire there. Number one, snoring. What a surprise. But we said not everyone that snores has obstructive sleep apnea, but what a risk factor it's going to be in itself. Number two, T for tired. Are you fatigued? Are you sleepy during the day? Especially if you're getting that seven to eight hours of sleep. When we think about O, O means obstructed, meaning that you're not breathing at all. P stands for pressure. What pressure? Blood pressure hypertension. And now we're going to go to bang. So B is going to be your body mass index, the BMI, your weight. Okay. Not everyone who is overweight and obese has sleep apnea, but I can't ignore it. There's a strong correlation. A is for age. And as all of us get older, you're at a higher risk. N for neck circumference. What are the measurements I'm worried about in males? A neck circumference of 17 inches. And in females, 16. G is for gender at the end. So when we say which um, gender is more at risk, well, usually it's going to be males. Ah. But once we become postmenopausal, oh man, it shoots up immensely in females. So we know, doctor, there are so many people out there that have gone undiagnosed. What are the consequences of not treating OSA? So let's start from the top and work our way down. So the brain, what can happen there? What about your cognitive function, your behaviors, your memory, being sharp during the day? Because what did I say is that having untreated OSA is like having sleep deprivation. Yeah. Can you imagine not getting oxygen going to your brain? You're gonna be at high risk for things like stroke, transit ischemic attacks, the heart. High risk for congestive heart failure, coronary artery disease, not getting that precious oxygen to the myocardium. That's the muscle of the heart itself. And not to mention arrhythmias, a very common one, 
atrial fibrillation. So when we talk about OSA not being treated, you could develop something called pulmonary hypertension, high blood pressure in the lungs, and not to mention my patients who have asthma, COPD, pulmonary fibrosis, they are striving for oxygen during the day. They get the double whammy at night. Right. That's the worst combination it could have. So my answer is, get diagnosed if well, you suspect it. And I'm it. thinking about the complaining spouse or partner. This is serious stuff. Yes, so it is. If you suspect that you may have OSA, mm -hmm. what do you do? The next step is always going to be get the correct diagnosis and find out how severe is it. So you need a sleep study. And sleep studies are two main types. There is a traditional, what we call in-lab study. Many people call that a PSG polysomography. Think of it as the Cadillac of studies. We're measuring everything there. Or for other people, maybe it's better if they do a sleep study at home, hence the word home sleep study, HST. So you can sleep at your own time. But the take home message is this. If you suspect it, get the right diagnosis and don't hesitate to know your severity and there are a lot of treatment options out there. Doctor, such great information and we have so much more to talk about. We wanted to show the audience just what to expect from a sleep study. So we paid a visit to Neil Ney from the Jupiter Medical Center Sleep Center. Take a look. We see a wide variety of patients and test them. Most are referred by their primary care physician. Many are encouraged to come in by a family member or a spouse who's observing the apnea. We test for all sleep disorders, but by far the epidemic level now is obstructive sleep apnea in our patient population. In an in-lab situation, we monitor brain waves, eye movements, muscle tone, EKG, breathing pattern, limb movements for periodic limb movement disorder and those things. So the in-lab test is a little bit more accurate and can diagnose a wide variety of sleep sleep disorders, whereas the home sleep test is really designed just for obstructive sleep apnea. During the sleep study, we're looking at effort to breathe and airflow. So we're looking to see airflow first. Do we see lack of airflow, which is an apnea? Then we look to see if there's effort to breathe or not. Um, and then we also look for a reduction in airflow, which is a hypopnea, also with effort to breathe. Um, which means it's an obstructive kind of hypopnea. In sleep apnea severity, our primary metric is AHI, or the apnea hypopnea index. Below five apneas hypopneas per hour is considered so mild that you probably wouldn't need treatment. Um, five to 15 per hour is considered mild. 15 to 30 times per hour is considered moderate. And 30 times per hour, on up is very severe, and that's where you see the most severe health effects. You're literally waking up once every two minutes to catch your breath, so the sleep quality is pretty much destroyed, it's gone, um, and there's lots of physiological effects because your heart rate is going up and down, your oxygen level is going up and down. If they display severe sleep apnea with oxygen drops, then the technician will intervene with CPAP and go in and go ahead and start applying CPAP for the patient and spend the rest of the night adjusting the pressure and trying different masks to make them comfortable. Every night that they spend at home without CPAP is another night where they may stop breathing three or four hundred times. So we want to stop that as quickly as we can. I first discovered that I had sleep apnea because my son used to tell me I snored. So I told him I didn't believe him. So one day he decided that he was going to videotape me. He was little and he played it for me the next morning and I was like, whoa, yeah, I definitely had a problem. So I followed up with the doctor and I had a sleep study and it came to be that I had sleep apnea. Welcome back to this special edition of Access Health. I'm back with Dr. Raj, and today we're taking a closer look at obstructive sleep apnea, or OSA. Doctor, I want to make sure our viewers understand the seriousness of this condition and the consequences if left untreated. I can't begin to tell you how important it is to make the right diagnosis once again, get that sleep study, and how severe is it? Mm -hmm. So people always ask me, no, Dr. Raj, can I die from this? I always give two answers. One is, I mean, most individuals won't die tomorrow. We're playing for the long game. We know it affects the heart, a risk factor for stroke, controlling your diabetes, high blood pressure, all these horrible, horrible things. And I definitely put those in the patient's mind. But the second part of the answer is, sure, you could die from it tomorrow. In fact, there are studies that compared non-treated OSA to drunk driving. Mm. Why? It's just like being sleep deprived. Mm. So the answer is, it is serious and it's something that needs to be treated. It is serious, but the good news is that there are treatments out there. Tell me what is the treatment plan? 
when you have OSA. So the main therapy is always going to be positive airway pressure, and this is going to be non-invasive. Mm -hmm. So many people just call it CPAP. Mm -hmm. So what does CPAP stand for? Continuous positive airway pressure. And let me emphasize this. My patients always think that CPAP is the mask. Mm -hmm. It's not the mask. It's the machine. It's how they're delivering the pressure, how they're delivering the breath. So let me just get this out of the way. For those who have sleep apnea, there are so many masks out there. You don't have to look like an astronaut going to the moon to wear a mask. In fact, you meet with my sleep technicians, you can pick the mask. It could go over the nose. It could be a full face. We make it individualized. But when we use CPAP, I deliver a pressure that's to be continuous. Mm -hmm. And what does it do? It actually will cause what I call a pneumatic splint, a little medical word, but I'll explain it. Pneumo means air, and it splints the upper airways. Remember, there's that collapse. So now the airflow can go through the upper airways, down into the lungs, delivering that precious oxygen. But you know what? We've come a long way. And the way we traditionally use CPAP is you come to that sleep lab, you put the mask on you, and I find out what is your magic pressure. Remember those letters, HI? It could be mild, moderate, severe. I want that to go back to normal. In some cases, if I'm really lucky, down to zero. And that's how I know what pressure to use in the lab. But nowadays, they have something called auto CPAP. Mm -hmm. So it kind of takes me out of the equation. You don't need me anymore. You had devices that would adjust the pressures automatically based on an algorithm. Well, doctor, there sounds like there's some great options depending on your patient's needs. And Access Health recently visited with Philips to discuss some of their latest additions to sleep therapy technology. Take a look. Inspired by patients and designed with minimalism in mind, the Dreamwear masks are helping to add the word comfort to the CPAP user's vocabulary. My name is Rachel Nolan. I'm a Senior Global Product Manager and Patient Interface, also known as CPAP Masks. My role here at Philips is to act as a translator. I talk to our patients about what's working and not working with their masks, and I take that back to our design and engineering team so that we can make mask solutions that work for our patients' needs. The Dream Family consists of multiple products, including the Dreamwear Mask System, the Dream Station CPAP machines, and the Dream Mapper software and app. They're not only designed to provide effective therapy, but also to really reach out to our patients and engage them in a more natural and comfortable way. In the past, sleep apnea masks had focused really on one thing, on function. Was it delivering the therapy the patient needed? It really didn't consider, was it comfortable? Was it something that the patient wanted to wear? Was it appealing to them? Our Dreamwear mask is a radical departure from traditional mask technology. In our traditional masks, we tended to have a nasal, a pillow, or a full face mask. They covered the bridge of the nose, they had a tube off the front of their face, and these were often pain points for our patients. It's what they told us in our research and all of our feedback. The Dreamwear isn't just an incremental step forward, it's a generational leap forward. We've taken our Dreamwear masks and completely changed the way patients interact with them. We've moved the tube to the top of the head. They're able to move freely at night and choose any sleep position that they want. We've made the cushions smaller and softer so that they're more comfortable for them to wear and they're easier to use. And we've opened up the field of vision so now they can wear their glasses again. They can watch TV, they can read a book, they can return to a bedtime routine that is more natural and comfortable for them to do. From a more personal perspective, the work that I do is, is really important to me. I know that I have family and friends that rely on our products to make them feel better and make them sleep better at night. And so knowing that the patient feedback that I'm getting on the masks and the design that then results from that is helping somebody that I love really makes my job worthwhile. And I find that the innovations that we're coming out with today are solving a lot of those problems and a lot of those needs. And we're looking to do even more as we move forward. And I think it's really exciting. Welcome back. Dr. Raj is still with us as we continue our conversation about obstructive sleep apnea, a serious sleep condition. Before the break, we were discussing the treatments for sleep apnea, CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure. Now, doctor, I imagine that adhering to this, this treatment is, is integral in their success. How do you get them to stick with it? Now, that's the trick, isn't it? That's the art of medicine. Mm -hmm. And the answer is, you know, 
Treatment is individualized and it's a multidisciplinary approach. There's no Dr. Raj unless I have my wonderful sleep technicians, my sleep center, they're all just amazing people. So things that I do to help them out is number one, hey, we have a way to make you have a mask fitting in my sleep office. Mm -hmm. Pick the mask that fits you. I mean, of course I'll jump in. If there's a medical reason why you may need a full face, I'll tell you, but essentially I want you to pick it. There are so many different styles and options. It's not what we had when they first developed sleep apnea And I here. imagine that the mask is, is a very integral part of the whole experience. One of the most important things, you know, and mm -hmm. not to mention finding the right pressure. And also, you know what we do sometimes? We do things called little pap naps. So what I do for my patients is that once you get the diagnosis, I know you're gonna give you positive airway pressure, I'll tell my tech, you know, just go into the one of our sleep rooms, put the mask on, give a little pressure, see if they're used to it. Little things like that help them to desensitize themselves to the mask itself. And you know what really amazes me is that many companies are empowering the patient to take their own control, not just wait for an appointment with the sleep specialist, but there's so much technology, new apps out there where they could actually monitor what their apnea index is going to be. Do they have a leak? Should they give me a call? So I think with the new technology, with this multidisciplinary approach, not just the doctor, I think we're on the right track to helping patients become more compliant. Well, it sounds like it is. Let's check back in with experts at Philips for more on the subject. As a respiratory therapist, when you come to the office, I'm going to make sure that you are getting the therapy that's been prescribed for you and that you're comfortable with that therapy. We're going to go through the types of masks that you have the choice to use. We're going to look at nasal masks that cover the nose or underneath the nose, as well as full face masks that cover the nose and the mouth if you're a mouth breather. When you're looking at the mask itself and the cushion, you're looking for something that's going to have the right comfort, the right fit, and the right seal for you. Once we've chosen a particular mask and sized properly, we're gonna look at other features of those types of masks to decide which one you need. If you wear your glasses and read a little bit each night before you go to bed, you want one that has a clear field of vision that doesn't get in the way and you can put those glasses on. Or if you roll around a lot at night, you're going to want a mask that has the hose at the top of the head that allows you a little bit more freedom of movement while you're wearing your mask. It's very important for you to get used to your therapy. So one of the tips to be desensitized to it is to start to wear your mask during the day. Wear it with the therapy on while you're watching TV. That night, you can go and try it a little bit more each night. You might pull it off in your sleep, but the more you wear it each night, you'll be able to grow that time that you'll eventually be wearing it the eight to 10 hours that you need to. When I'm with a patient, I want to make sure that they know that being adherent to their therapy is important. So I learn about their lifestyle, and if I find out that they're a traveler, I'm going to make the recommendation that they have a travel CPAP like the Dream Station Go to be able to use every single night, even while they're traveling because there is not a residual effect to CPAP therapy. So if you do not have and use it every night, your obstructive sleep apnea will be back to how it was before you were treated. Once you've got your therapy, you can download the Philips Dream Mapper app that will help you get desensitized as well to your therapy. The Philips Dream Mapper app will actually allow you to see each night whether you had a leak in your mask and it was fitting properly. It'll allow you to know whether you had any apneic periods the night before as well. And also allows you to know how many hours you've worn it and if you wore it properly. By following your progress and setting goals with the app, it will help you to stick with your therapy. After my first sleep, sleep study and I got my mask and my machine and I went back to the sleep doctor and he asked me how I felt, I, I literally like broke down in tears because it still makes me choke up today because I can't believe like the difference that it makes like when you have a good night's sleep. And I, that's something that I hadn't experienced in a very long time. Welcome back. I'm here with Dr. Raj Desgupta. We've learned so much today about OSA, the benefits of integrative technology, and how patients can be empowered by all this information. Doctor, before you go, do you have any last words of advice for anyone who's been diagnosed or thinks that they may have OSA? I'm talking about this subject, it affects so many of my patients. I think the bottom line point is, you know what, if you have OSA, you're not alone. OSA affects many individuals in many different ways. And like we talked about today, you name the organ in your body, I'll tell you what untreated OSA does. Mm -hmm. 
So the answer is get the right diagnosis once again, severity, and you know what? There are so many options now when we talk about treatments that no one should actually have to suffer. We have good treatments out there. I mean, what a wealth of information. I think everyone out there who thinks they may have it or has been diagnosed feels feels a little bit better today. Well, thanks. Thank you, doctor. Come back again and see us. I will. Your health depends on getting enough sleep. If you or your partner experiences any symptoms of snoring or sleep apnea, consult a doctor. And for more information on today's important discussion, please visit sleepapnea.com. And as always, you can visit our website at accesshealth.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We'll see you next time.